And so now it is my pleasure to introduce the writer and professor, um, Dan Flores. He is the author of eight books, most recently, Visions of the Big Sky, Art in the West, which he will be discussing today. Um, his books and essays have been honored by the Western Histori History Association, Western Writers of America, the Denver Public Library, the National Cowboy Museum, the Oklahoma Book Awards, the University of Oklahoma Press, the Montana Historical Society, and the Texas State Historical Association. His next book, Coyote America, will be coming out in 2012. Please welcome Dan Flores. Thank you for coming out this afternoon and for being a supporter of books and publishing. And in this particular case, art, uh, because what I'm going to tell you about is a book, uh, a brand new book um, that is uh, on the art and photography of the northern Rockies and northern plains. Uh, it's called Visions of the Big Sky, Painting and Photographing the Northern Rocky Mountain West. And uh, I, I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about sort of the origins of this book. And uh, if you'll permit me, I'm going to begin that by, uh, I'm not going to quote from a review, but I'll just tell you that a review of this book that appeared just a few days ago made the point um, in the opening paragraph of the review that this is a book that Western art history has waited a long time for and so I want to try to explain what that means um, and what the reviewer intended by saying that uh, and while I'm speaking by the way you're seeing the images from the book scroll by on the screen um, uh, there are something like a hundred and fifty photographs and paintings in visions of the big sky and the reason I think this is a book that um, has attracted some attention as something new in Western art history is because of the simple fact that this part of the West, believe it or not, um, has not been a region that has been thought of um, for very long at all as one of the privileged regions of the West that has produced a Western art tradition. Uh, there are basically three regions in the American West. Uh, the Yosemite Valley and Carmel region of California is one. The Colorado Plateau is another. And the Southwest, particularly northern New Mexico, is a third that have their own distinctive Western art traditions and are, are very much famous for that. But the Northern Rockies, despite the fact that we have all these grand parks and this marvelous history in our, uh, our background here, has not really um, had that kind of sense about its regional art in time. And so I came uh, by this particular topic and uh, primarily because of two things that happened uh, in my life. One of them was moving to Montana in uh, 1992 and having the good luck the first semester I was here to have in one of my classes in Western history a young man whose name was Alan Jones and who four years later became the editor of the Big Sky Journal and Alan remembering uh, some slideshow that I had um, used in the class he had taken with me called me one day in about 1996 and asked me if I would start a column, Images of the West, for the Big Sky Journal. That column is, is still um, featured in the Big Sky Journal today, and I agreed to do it. And so, really, writing this book originated that way, with uh, a column in the Big Sky Journal magazine. The other thing that I think contributed to the evolution of this particular book and to someone like me writing a book about the art of the northern west uh, was the simple fact that I a few years ago uh, built a house outside Santa Fe New Mexico and so started spending summers down there uh, starting in about 2003 and I began to notice as I walked into bookstores in Santa Fe that 
You could walk into a bookstore like Collected Works on the Plaza of Santa Fe and an entire wall, probably the length of the wall over here beside us, would be filled with books on the art of the Southwest. I mean, just thousands of titles. And I would return to Montana and walk into bookstores in Missoula or Bozeman and whereas the literary racks would be full of novels and nonfiction books about the Northern Rockies, books on art would number maybe 25 or 30 and seven-eighths of them would have Charlie Russell in the title. So the result of those experiences convinced me that there was a book to be written about the art of this part of the world, particularly as you're going to hear me say, and as you watch some of these images scroll by, particularly because in the period from about 1830 up until 1950 or so, most of the very best photographers and painters in the United States visited the Northern Rockies and captured landscapes, cowboy life, Indian life in particular, and especially a sense of the Northern Rockies as this distinctive sort of wilderness Eden of huge landscapes and big charismatic animals. That was an artistic tradition that wasn't similar to anything else anywhere in the West. In the West. I mean, in the Southwest, for example, there is no such tradition of charismatic animals uh, certainly there's a tradition of painting Indians, but it's very different from the one up here. In the Southwest, people who painted and photographed Indians did so with the idea that they were photographing people who were living in an ancient homeland that they had inhabited for thousands of years. Whereas in this part of the world, Indians were portrayed from the 19th century on into the middle of the 20th century as people who were vanishing and disappearing. And so the Artwork was basically kind of salvage work. So, let me get a drink of water here. So the result of all this was work on a book that, as you watch these images scroll by, that's a very famous one by an Indian painter named Fritz Shoulder called Custer and 20,000 Indians. Uh, an ironic title. Let me just briefly uh, describe for you the contents. There are 33 painters treated in this book, 16 photographers, and out of that number, out of the 33 painters, eight of them are women. One of the things I tried to do was to not only resurrect this regional art tradition for the Northern Rockies, which had been lost and really eclipsed by the literary scene in this part of the world. But I also tried to recapture the sense that there were women painters and photographers working here. One of the reasons I did that was because of a book that came out about seven or eight years ago called Independent Spirits, a book about women painters in the West. And I immediately bought a copy and flipped to the index and looked up Montana, all the artists and photographers uh, were listed by state, I looked up Montana, zero, not one single woman painter or photographer listed for Montana. Wyoming had one, Idaho had two. The book had three chapters on the women painters of California and two chapters on the women artists of New Mexico. And so when I started working on this, I made some effort to try to resurrect uh, some of these women painters and photographers who had worked here. And so out of my 33 painters, eight of them are women, and six of them are American Indians. And out of the photographers, there are three women photographers and two Indian photographers. So I, I obviously was trying to, to create a, a more well-rounded look at the people who had worked in this part of the world. And just to tell you who... Uh, the, uh, some of these images are credited to, I'll just, I won't go through an entire list, but to mention some of the very famous people who worked in the Northern Rockies. There, of course, was George Catlin and Carl Bodmer and John James Audubon, John Mick Stanley, Alfred Jacob Miller, Albert Bierstadt, Thomas Moran, 
Carl Rungius, um, Charlie Russell, Frederick Remington, Joseph Henry Sharp, Herbert Dunton, William R. Lay, Maynard Dixon, John Clymer, Vinold Rice, Thomas Hart Benton, and then there were Frey Dana, Catherine Layton, Zoe Byler, Elizabeth Lockery, Emily Carr, just to mention some of the women painters. Among the photographers, very famous people like William Henry Jackson, Roland Reed, Edward Sheriff Curtis, Ansel Adams, and of course Evelyn Cameron, probably the most famous woman photographer who worked in this part of the world. And among the Indians, I'm not going to mention all of them, but two of them whose works appear here who are probably a couple of the most famous Indian artists in America and who came to Montana and worked were Fritz Shoulder and T.C. Cannon. So the point, I think, is that this is a story that somehow we have managed to overlook, which I think explains that comment in the review of, from a few days ago that art history in the West has waited a long time for, uh, for a book like this. So what I'm going to do from this point is to um, read you a bit, a few selections from the book, uh, and I'll start out uh, with the introduction. It's called Art and Regional Identity in a Western Paradise, and uh, I'm going to try to give you a sense by the readings I'm selecting here of both the book's coverage and a little bit about how um, my interpretation goes. This is a book that's, that's uh, certainly designed as a coffee table book, but unlike most coffee table books, it has a, a very significant text. There are 25 chapters, and each one of them has about seven or eight pages of text. The book begins this way. Sitting on the banks of Idaho's Salmon River one August a few years ago, Sifting our toes through the white sand of our camps along the fabled river of no return, I and some other river runners came up with a question that none of us could quite answer. But as the days in frothing green water and nights under the moon and Mars passed, the more I thought about our puzzlement, the more I came to think that we had been idly probing the heart of regional identity in the northern Rocky Mountain West. The question was really a simple one. How has it happened and why that the past 200 years of history in the West has granted the states of California and New Mexico world-class legacies of photographers and painters while reserving major music traditions for Texas and Washington? And why, at least for the past decades, has Montana attracted primarily writers? In the 21st century, at least nine influential art colonies exist in the West predictably in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and Austin, but also in smaller places such as Carmel, Santa Fe and Taos, and Missoula and Livingston. But why the clearly defined differentiation? Photographers in Carmel, musicians in Texas and the coastal cities, painters in New Mexico, writers in Montana. Three quarters of a century ago, well before Joseph Kinsey Howard launched Northern Rockies environmental literature with Montana High, Wide, and Handsome, before A.B. Guthrie won the Pulitzer Prize for The Big Sky, and Richard Hugo's poetry and classics such as The Lady in Kicking Horse Reservoir set the Montana literary tradition in motion, the majority of cultural observers would have predicted that if the Northern Rockies were to produce any cultural attainment worthy of attention, it would be a place of visual artists, not wordsmiths. With the three grand alpine national parks of Yellowstone, Glacier, and Grand Tetons already extant or in the process of becoming, the Northern Rockies did not lack for aesthetic possibilities. And the region had a range of place-based cultures from the Blackfeet and the Crows to Stoic cowboys and dust-blown homesteaders that early 20th century artists and painters and filmmakers, too, seemed to favor. Finally, Montana in particular had Charlie Russell. In only one other place in America, New Mexico, with Georgia O'Keeffe, has an artist stood as so emblematic of a state as Charlie Russell did and does for Montana. Yet, unlike the high desert, southern Rockies country of New Mexico, in the northern Rockies, it was not the visual artists, but the writers whose voices prevailed. 
This is a book then that in part attempts to throw light on why that unexpected development happened the way it did. But beyond that explanation, this book is an effort to resurrect a regional visual legacy. So that's how the book begins. I'm going to flip to the end of the introduction and read you one more selection from the introduction and then I'll pick out a couple of chapters here um, in order to give you a sense of the book. Historically, this is a region that for well over a century shaped the world's sense of the realities of the American West. Let me tell you how I know this. The chain of events that led me to write this book began in 1992 when I moved to Montana to take a position at the University in Missoula. By sheer happenstance, that first semester, Alan Jones, the future editor of a regional magazine called the Big Sky Journal, took one of my classes. Four years later, Alan invited me to launch a column, Images of the West, for that publication, and for almost a decade, as I built a Bitterroot Valley house and ranch head around me and explored this new world, I researched and wrote the essays that have become this book. I wrote them because I was fascinated by the Northern Rockies, and I wrote them because they were a powerful avenue for my immersion in place. That at least some of these essays have a personal tone derives from the fact that through them, through the eyes of the artist I was writing about, and out of the images themselves, I was becoming a resident of the Northern Rockies. But there was one other element at work. The first spring I spent in Montana, three friends and I took off to float the wild and scenic stretch of the Missouri River as soon as classes were done in May. Before Lewis and Clark mania turned the Missouri River into a rivercraft interstate, we were lucky enough to be the only campers in the White Cliffs Narrows. This book has its genesis in what happened the next morning. Sunrise in the White Cliffs Narrows came on as a painterly vision on May the 19th, 1993. Soothed into a dreamless night by the living rush of the Missouri only feet away, I had awakened in the twilight of pre-dawn, glanced around camp sleepily, and tucked my head back into my bag, only to be jerked bolt upright a few minutes later when slanting yellow sunlight caught the white cliffs across the river with the blinding force of a searchlight. The effect in that narrow canyon was like turning on a 500-watt bulb in a darkened room, and it yanked me out of the sleeping bag and to the river's edge with my mouth open in a shock of recognition. Recognition? I'd never been to this place before in my life. But looking around me at the fantastically sculpted hoodoos and pedestals and the sandstone arch called the Eye of the Needle, at the basaltic knife of Labarge Rock, at waterfall arrowing low over the churning brown water, and a herd of mule deer pogoing away into the hills at my sudden apparition, the whole of it almost a performance staged beneath an impossibly lit sky. It came to me of a sudden that this was the northern Rockies world my life preparation had set me up to expect and that what I was experiencing as recognition was the late 20th century version of a Western scene that the artists and photographers who saw and portrayed this part of the American West a century and more ago had literally downloaded into my mind. In some significant measure, art had pre-adapted me to stand in this spot and be frozen by a visual deja vu, and I know that I am assuredly not alone. It was what we might call an insistent moment. Years later, among many wonderful passages in Montana writer William Kittredge's The Nature of Generosity, I came across these lines. We are like trout in the dazzling stream of what is. Transformative moments that cannot be ignored come to us once in a while. The world insists, demanding that we see. Art itself, it seems to me, writing, music, photography, painting, is humanity's holy act of netting those insistent moments, pulling them out of the dazzling stream and fixing them for all time and for anyone to see. It's the act whereby Hemingway gave us Pamplona and gracile bulls hooking at white pantaloon runners. Bob Dylan captured as a succession of piercing images entangled up in blue. Ansel Adams preserved as one poignant full moon implying an endless procession of them drifting up over Hernandez, New Mexico. And George O'Keefe told us that the flesh is mortal, 
but the world endures through the simple act of holding a bone against the sky and painting the blue that will always be there. Visual art, especially good visual art, gives us mortal humans a simple set of instructions. Stop, look, and see. Do not sleepwalk through the only life you have, for the world is beautiful and marvelous and there are many radiant moments. And after all, time spent with fine art is not subtracted from one's allotted span. <laughs> Remember that. Okay, let me read you, uh, I'll read you selections from uh, three of the chapters in the book. As I said, there are 25 of them. Um, most of them are, are biographical. They take the careers of particular painters or photographers and, and talk about their careers and their impact on establishing for the world how the West gets viewed, particularly in this part of the world, this kind of wilderness Eden idea that is so permeates so much of the art. But in some of the chapters, I took on events in the history of the Northern West and tried to talk about how artists had portrayed those events and given us a sense of how to understand them through time. One of the ones I did that way, of course, was the journey of Lewis and Clark. And another one was the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So let me read you a few selections, a few excerpts from the chapter called Coming to Terms with the Little Bighorn. If art, like mythology, represents the human struggle to reduce the complexity of the world to a single delimited throb of an imprint, then art has long been wobbly with the most famous one day event in the history of the big sky country. Think on all these thousands of years of human striving in the northern plains and northern Rockies and it seems not a little astonishing that a single image from a single battle that likely lasted little more than an hour should stand as shorthand for so much. And yet, as people around the world know, how you feel about one particular image from that battle of many names, I mean whether you prefer the loser upright and heroic or prostrate and defamed, remains even in this new century a kind of bumper sticker proclamation about how you view the whole history of the American West. I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s. My first grade class picture shows me decked out in Davy Crockett gear, straight out of the 1955 Disney series starring Fess Parker. By the time I first saw the Little Bighorn Battlefield in 1973, I looked more like one of the Indians that the Crockett's of the world had displaced. Big history had unreeled in those years. I matriculated from first grade to graduate school civil rights and Vietnam and the ecology movement and Sam Peckinpah in the director's chair. There was also this, Arthur Penn's astonishing movie of Thomas Berger's novel, Little Big Man, had appeared in 1970 and however unlikely a Cheyenne Dustin Hoffman seemed, or Asian actress Amy Eccles appeared as his Indian wife, the wise and gentle character played by Chief Dan George and the film's portrayal of Custer as racist lunatic appeared to millions of us as really close to the mark. When I first walked around the battlefield in 1973 and tried to square the ground with the movie, the place was still called Custer Battlefield National Monument. Like our perception of Custer and the West, that was about to change. Indian artist Fritz Shoulders, Custer and 20,000 Indians, which in fact portrayed no Indians, implying that the battle was about nothing but Custer in the face of white America, was painted in 1969, the same year that Vine Deloria, a skewer of a book, Custer Died for Your Sins, became a bestseller. D. Brown's Bury My Heart, It Wounded Knee, How the West Was Lost, the cover said came out in 1971. That summer I first walked the prairie above the Greasy Grass Creek was in fact the summer following the American Indian Movement's occupation of Wounded Knee. Like art, history learns from the way events continue to unfold. Okay. 
going to skip through a good bit of it here and get towards the end. Because of the battle's power in history, modern Indian artists, and I will admit that most of my artists in this chapter are, are native ones, modern Indian artists, in fact, have had a difficult time avoiding dealing with the Little Bighorn. So to Fritz Scholder's ironic distillation of event that, as he sees it, is so much about Custer that the Indians are invisible, we can add the late, great T.C. Cannon's own typically ironic vision in Custer, go get them. Then there is South Dakota artist Randy Lee White's Custer's Last Stand Revisited, done in 1980. White gives Custer and his men credit for a last stand, all right, but, and a lot of this chapter, by the way, is about whether or not there was a last stand because almost all the white artists have so portrayed the battle. And in fact, of course, we don't know whether there was a last stand at all. There's simply no evidence for it. Randy Lee White gives Custer and his men credit for a last stand, all right, but in his attempt to help, help us gain some control over an affair that will not go away, he riffs on Kicking Bear's ledger painting, one of the very early Indian paintings of the Little Bighorn, by converting the 7th Cavalry into used car salesmen, defending a Montana slope where irate Indians bent on revenge are surrounded by their overheating and dying Junker Fords and Chevys. Humor is Sherman Alexie's point, too, in his poem about Buffalo Bill's returning to become one of the, as Sherman Alexie calls it, great piano hunters of all time. Buffalo Bill, in that poem, works his way through pianos as far as the eye could see, pianos upon pianos, all wild and within an arm's length, pianos from horizon to horizon. The message, of course, is to laugh is to heal. For plenty of people, though, laughter and the Little Bighorn are irreconcilable. Under blue skies and a coppery sun in September of 1997, I spent a couple of days with an old friend, then Little Bighorn Battlefield Superintendent Gerard Baker, who had succeeded Barbara Boer to become the second Indian ever to head up the National Monument. When I drove up in mid-afternoon and sought out Gerard, in a headquarters now much staffed by Indians, which was a noticeable change since I had been there in 1973, Gerard took off work and we spent the afternoon driving around the battlefield in his pickup, ruminating on what had happened there and what it all means. A Mandan Hidatsa, fascinated with his people's history, Gerard is a devourer of books, but I don't recall that he said anything at all about Custer that afternoon. He mostly talked about how various Indians saw the event, how Custer's scouts knew the village was enormous because they could see a gigantic roiling insect cloud over what had to be an enormous pony herd 20 miles away, how effective particular Indian sharpshooters were, how the Cheyenne Two Moons described the fight as taking no longer than it takes a hungry man to eat his dinner, and how one trooper escaping the field, ended up arrowed by a returning hunter despite shouts from the rest of the Indians to let him go. That night, staying up late to talk, Gerard confessed that his efforts to make the battlefield a site that conveyed meaning and respect for Indians as well as whites had made him, at least among certain elements, one of the most hated native people in America. Here we were 121 years after the event and the Little Bighorn was still capable of absolutely enraging people. The next morning under rustling cottonwoods located about where the Cheyenne camp was set up in 1876, we sweated. When we emerged from Gerard's sweat lodge, scrubbed with sagebrush and panning from the heat, we slid steaming into the warm waters of the Little Bighorn and sat there submerged to our necks perfumed with the soapy scent of bear root, reflecting on, among other ideas, how this place and what happened here just will not let go of us, no matter how far down the timeline we get. It seems that even when history joins everyone from all sides of a past event into a common future, we humans rarely can escape the burdens of the past, and certainly not when it's a bloody event such as the Little Bighorn. Looking back now, I don't know why Gerard and I felt surprised at this. Ireland, the Middle East, the Balkans, the American West, they've all made both art and history political and ideological. But perhaps, 
sitting there in the tepid September waters of the Greasy Grass Creek, it was not a surprise so much as a frustrated anticipation we were feeling. The sense that someday someone is going to do the little bighorn painting that will finally make us understand that everybody's story is our own. That's how that particular chapter goes, at least in part. So let me read you a couple of selections from two others here. Uh, I promised you that one of the things I did with this book was to try to resurrect uh, women painters in the West, as, uh, particularly in this part of the West, who had been almost completely ignored. And one of the ones uh, whose work uh, I really became fascinated with was a woman named Frey Dana. Um, you'll see if I can catch it when it scrolls by, I'll point her out to you. She's a very beautiful young woman, sort of dressed in Victorian uh, period uh, dress with a hat on. And so uh, you might take a look when that one scrolls by and you can put a face to this particular story. Frey Dana was a native of Indiana, born in Terre Haute in 1874. What she did come by as a nurtured legacy was her large ambition for art. Her mother wanted to be an artist and decided before Frey was born that she would give her daughter every chance for success in the arts. Seemingly, the fates were in accord, for after a divorce, her mother married James Dinwoody, a stepfather thrilled enough at Frey's adolescent prospects that he enrolled her in an arts program in Cincinnati in 1892 when she was 18. There she got the opportunity to study with soon-to-be-famous Western artist Joseph Henry Sharp, who was completely taken with the beautiful young Midwesterner's talent and promise. Working with Sharp was not young Frey's first intimation that her destiny lay westward, though. Her stepfather's family owned land near Parkman, Wyoming, and during a family visit there the year before, destiny had said hello in the form of a 27-year-old cowboy named Edwin Dana, whose Massachusetts family had moved to Montana in the 1860s. Edwin may have been a cowboy, but the New England roots were visible. Smitten with this feminine brown-haired painter, he penned verse for her, sang her cowboy songs, read her Emily Dickinson by Firelight. Frey was only 17 at the time, but she was bright enough to understand the complexities of the situation. Bound for Paris and tutelage at the expert hands of Mary Cassatt, an American expatriate who was the only woman ever to have won the gold prize at the Paris Salon, Frey was no Westerner by instinct. That Edwin won his intelligent and ambitious lovely across such a distance and obstacles speaks to his own impressive qualities. In fact, their friend Mildred Walker remembered in 1986 that they were wonderful together, both witty, both full of life. It took him five years, but in 1896, 32-year-old Edwin married 22-year-old Frey in a ceremony on his Pass Creek Ranch north of the Bighorn Range. Even so, young Frey was savvy enough, liberated enough, you might say, that she had Edwin sign what we would call today a prenuptial agreement, <laughs> stipulating regular trips to the East and Europe so that she might pursue her large ambition to be famous. Okay, now this is where Frey Dana's life gets really interesting and where it also begins to contrast so strikingly with that of other female artists in the West. When she first went to the Wyoming-Montana border in 1896, it was obvious that the West had the capacity to move her. And I want to quote to you a couple of times here from the journals that she kept. Here's one after she had been in uh, Wyoming and Montana. She lived right on the border from March 1907. And here's what she said. Went into the mountains today. Snow banks to the horses' necks, but in the bare spots were those fragile purple lilies that grow only on the heights. There was a cold, pure wind smelling of pine and sagebrush, and to look down over the valley was like looking into the heart of an opal. 
She was an artist who obviously could write as well. Okay, let me flip over to another section here. The intimations of trouble, though, are there in her journals as early as the following summer of that same year, 1907. This is what she wrote on June the 5th. Today is Valakaz's birthday. I always keep it in my heart, but I speak no more of my vanished dreams. This life and the thoughts I used to think were dreams. Exactly what was happening in her life, no one knows. She doesn't really say in her journals. But Edwin and the growing resistance he seems to have put up to their prenuptial agreement appears to have been at the core of it. Thus, at the gravid age of 38, precisely Georgia O'Keeffe's age when she went for her first summer in New Mexico and never looked back, Frey Dana seems to have abandoned her own dreams. Here is what she wrote in her diary on September the 28th, 1911. New York, glad, glad, glad. It's noisy, it's dirty, the people in the streets are horribly rude, but I am happy to get back in the midst of life. Anything but the sagebrush and the jackrabbits. But this New York visit only served to end her dreams, not renew them. Face to face with what she called a black cloud of melancholy on my soul, she made her decision. I could fight the world and conquer, but I cannot fight the world and Edwin too. He will always pull against me in the life I desire, so I shall give up. He is one. I will never bother any more with my desires or ambitions. Why struggle? I'll go back to the ranch, but the loneliness. At that same age, Georgia O'Keeffe was in Taos, writing her friends back east that, I weigh 118. I feel so alive I'm apt to crack at any moment. And I don't know whether you know how important these days are for me. They seem to be like the loud ring of a hammer striking something hard. Frey Dana, by contrast, was reduced to a very different reaction. Of the Westerners who visited the ranch, she wrote, For all these people, I have to make their beds and empty their slops and wait on them. How the spirit doth rebel, especially at having to talk to them when they're not interesting. And then this, I do not like to look out the window any more than I can help, for I do not want to see the beautiful fields. They have been fed with my heart's blood and watered by my tears. Think again on women artists in the Northern Rockies, too, like Catherine Layton, married to lawyer Edwin Layton. Like Frey Dana, Layton was from a more urbane setting in the East. Both she and her husband were New Englanders who in 1910 moved to Los Angeles where her brother was the mayor. Together, the Laytons began to visit the Northern Rockies by car as early as 1920. She was painting in Banff in 1923, and having met artist Charlie Russell and his wife Nancy at a Los Angeles party in 1924, she visited Russell and Glacier Park in 1925. The next summer, both Layton and her husband were guests of the Great Northern Railroad. Catherine Layton went on to paint more than 600 paintings of Indians from the Northern Rockies by visiting in the summers. Frey Dana, who lived in this part of the world, painted one portrait of an Indian and a total of about 35 works in the time that she was in the West. Let me end this by simply saying to you, or reading to you, this uh, reaction at the end of this particular chapter. Dana's perspective on life in the West was chilling and bittered as she was by the course of her life. Beauty of any kind is a thing held cheap out here in this land of hard realities and glaring sun and alkali. There are no nuances. She thought Montana cities such as Billings summed up everything about the West she had come to detest. There's not a tree. The bitter ugliness strikes to the bone and the sun is bright and hard. Mildred Walker found Frey Dana almost shockingly resentful during her last years in Great Falls and was astonished to hear her say that she wished she had never married, that she had stayed in Paris. Her last letter was written to the University of Montana to whom she bequeathed her work in 1947. I do not know that there is anything to tell you about my life. My annals are short and simple. I was born. I married. I painted a little. I'm ready to die. Now I have to tell you that 
Her story is atypical. That is not the sort of experience that most of these women painters uh, in the northern West had, certainly not the experience that someone like the photographer Evelyn Cameron had, but Frey Dana certainly had a, a, a rough time in this part of the world. Yeah? Did she have children? She didn't. She did not have children. Um, I'm, and I'm not sure exactly why, uh, whether she couldn't have them or her husband couldn't or what, but she didn't have any. I'll end this up to you by reading a, a, a short selection from the last chapter, chapter 25 in the book, In Visions of the Big Sky. It's called, In the End, What Was Charlie Russell Trying to Tell Us? <laughs> I saved Russell for the end of the book because he is such an important figure in this part of the world, and I thought this was the primary thing to try to grapple with. What was Charlie Russell trying to tell us down the timeline? In 1908, Three years after the freshly minted state of Montana had passed a law requiring its veterinarians to infect any captured wolves that came their way with sarcoptic mange and then release them to spread the disease into the wild population, the cowboy artist Charlie Russell sat down in Great Falls to pen a letter to a friend, the writer Frank Bird Linderman. As Russell reflexively did when he wrote Almost Anyone, he appended a quick and wonderful little watercolor sketch to the top of the page. Knowing that Linderman's sympathies were similar to his, Russell drew a simple little ecological set piece of two of his favorite subjects. A buffalo, in this case it was a, the carcass of a buffalo, and a wolf. Then to convey his meaning, Russell added a bit of doggerel. You sleeping relics of the past, if I but had my way, I'd clothe your frames with meat and hide and wake you up today. Okay. Let me find my spot here. More than a century and a quarter after his arrival in our region, Charlie Russell is the patron saint of the Northern West. The only other part of America that has taken an artist as its patron figure is the Southwest, as I mentioned to you earlier, where George O'Keefe holds that honor with a very different vision of the world. Parse the 21st century West into South and North, and you get the mystical and feminine desert versus a man's world of big animals and big sky, for which we largely have O'Keefe and Russell to thank. Okay, let me see. Russell left us a lot of material to sift through, to figure out his message. And like every life, his was full of contradictions. But I think he was dead serious all his life about the motivation that seems to track through almost every piece of art he made. It's there from the beginning, but perhaps appears in its pithiest in the phrase he chose for his career breakthrough, the one-man show at the Folsom Galleries in New York in 1911. He called it, and he picked the title for it, The West That Has Passed. Charlie Russell, St. Louis kinsman of the Bent Brothers of the Southwest Fur Trade, whose stories he grew up reading, was utterly convinced that the old days were better than the new. As he had his fictional Rawhide Rawlins character say, like all things, things that happened that's worthwhile, it was a long time ago. <laughs> the most notorious example of Russell's antipathy to the modern world in this case, the 20th century, was his famous horror of automobiles. Although he would ride as Nancy piloted her Lincolns and Cadillacs and Pierce Arrows, at speeds over 30, he had a tendency to shriek, Jesus Christ! <laughs> he preferred horses right to the end. Russell, as the perceptive Western writer J. Frank Dobie articulated perfectly, was not inclined to be a hard thinker, but evaluated life out of instinctive predilections. To instinct we can add his hero-sized generosity of spirit. As Nancy wrote about their first meeting, 
in time I came to know that he could not see wrong in anybody. He never believed anyone did a bad act intentionally. It was always an accident. Despite Russell's occasional rant at the pioneer, Russell's art treats the heartbreaking environmental history of the West, which he witnessed during his lifetime, almost as if it were accidental. For example, at the height of his powers and maturity, Russell was still portraying mountain men as regional heroes, the romance makers, he called them in a 1918 oil. And look at his great work, Salute of the Robe Trade, done in 1920, for which Nancy Russell wrangled the stupendous sum of $10,000 in 1921. It's a masterful painting with all the elements of light action and Missouri River Square Butte scenery that Russell patrons and Western realism aficionados could ever want. But no hint or even irony that the rope trade was the death knell for the same West that Russell found so sacred. He painted another work called When the Land Belonged to God in order to convey the sacredness of the Montana that he called Dreamtime Montana. Nothing so devastated the West that belonged to God as much as the arrival of the global market economy in the form of the fur trade. Maybe these kinds of scenes all fall into the category of good people doing bad things accidentally. Maybe such paintings sold well to Russell's white male patrons who tended towards the corporate symbolic frontier types. Or maybe Russell really did believe, and many people do believe, that trapping off all the fur bearers, killing all the big animals, cutting down most of the trees, and grazing off a lot of the grass, I'm using his phrases, by the way, from a... Uh, uh, address he made at a uh, conference, that all this really was a heroically romantic enterprise. What I think, though, Charlie Russell really was trying to tell us, however tolerantly forgiving or maybe just muddled he might have been about cause and effect, was that it's a far better thing to have had a West and to have one now where Indian culture is healthy and Indians are respected and admired for who they are than one where racism and acculturation threaten their extinction. And to me, Russell's voice was a loud and clear amen for a West populated with his beloved buffalo, even wolves and grizzlies and wild horses whose rights on the prairies he defended vigorously just before he died. So what I've been preparing to say is that I believe Charlie Russell's art actually speaks for wilderness in our time. True enough, he was not a hard thinker about history, and he was not clairvoyant. When he went to Montana's Mission Valley to help round up Michelle Pablo's buffalo herd for sale to Canada in 1908, he thought it was the final buffalo chase. However, his restoration sentiments seem fairly clear in those lines to Frank Linderman. You sleeping relics of the past, if I but had my way, I'd clothe your frames with meat and hide and wake you up today. So how many whoops of Jesus Christ would we get from Charlie Russell if he knew about wolves, buffalo, grizzlies, and wild horses in 21st century Montana and the West? Or how well Indians are doing, their cultures recovering, their cultures recovering, their numbers growing, their tribal histories now taught in public schools as part of everybody's stories. Seventy-five years ago, the only direction Russell could see that kind of West was behind him. As a result, he spent his whole life looking over his shoulder. But as a result of the Charlie Russell vision, a hero's vision, something like what he dreamed we may get to live. That's how the book ends, and thank you for listening. I appreciate it. May I ask about one of the pictures? Uh -huh. It looked like Taos. It looked like the, the Pueblos and Taos. Is that in Montana? That's not in Montana. Uh, that's a very accurate uh, reaction to it. That's Taos Pueblo. And the reason that's in there uh, is because in the introduction, one of the points I try to make about the differing ways that the northern Rockies and the southwest have interpreted the west is 
in the Southwest, because of the existence of ruins like Canyon de Chez and Taos Pueblo, which is a thousand years old, the artists and the photographers down there have never been able to portray that part of the West as this kind of virginal wilderness. They've always portrayed it as this ancient homeland of Indian people who have been there for thousands of years. But because we don't have any ruins like that in this part of the West, it was fairly easy for people to come here in the 19th century and assume that this was a brand new world. And that's pretty much how the artists tended to, to portray it, as if it was nature, as Charlie Russell put it, straight from the hand of God as if there hadn't actually been people here all along and the, and the Indians who were here were literally going to disappear. So that particular image is to make that, that point uh, about the difference between the two regions and how they're portrayed. Yes, David. Thanks for this wonderful presentation. I'm really excited to look at this and uh, I just can't wait. Um, <laughs> I'm, it sounds in your last chapter as though um, there's more than gesture to the new west and and even I'm hearing a kind of uh, visionary post new west uh, gesture there but I wonder um, how the, the body of the book I see several images uh, that aren't nostalgic um, yeah uh, but that are trying to face, you know, the modern economies and colonial histories of the, of the West. Exactly. Yeah. I, I just wonder how how much of that you were able to address in this. Yeah. Well, it's there a lot. Um, and I, by the way, I like being thought of as post post something. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, but it's there that. That whole sense of, um, of kind of a modern critique of the West, I think, is throughout the book. It probably has a lot to do with some of the images I selected, and uh, probably what you were seeing were uh, J. Frank Haynes's photographs of the industrial transformation of the northern West in the late 19th and early 20th century. And so I didn't shy away from that. I mean, people like Charlie Russell and Frederick Remington were certainly doing the nostalgic thing, and, and Edward Sheriff Curtis, too. They're looking back at a world that they really weren't experiencing themselves, but which they regarded as this, you know, this nostalgic old West that was sort of the, the world as God had created it. But a lot of the artists whose work I was attracted to, like Maynard Dixon, for example, whose work is on the cover of the book, The Home of the Blackfeet. Um, Maynard Dixon came to Montana at Louis Hill's uh, request in 1914, Louis Hill, of course, of the Great Northern Railroad, and he portrayed the world that he saw. And so did painters like Vinold Rice, for example, a portrait painter who also uh, worked for the Great Northern and who endlessly ran up against Louis Hill's insistence that he paint the Blackfeet in their traditional dress and what Vino Rice wanted to do was to portray them as they were living in calico shirts and blue jeans and cowboy hats in the 20th century. So I think that kind of tension between an inclination on the part of a few of these artists who maybe have dominated the view of this part of the world and those who were who were presenting a more realistic version of 20th century uh, Northern Rockies um, imagery it probably informs a lot of the a lot of the book. Uh, I mean, I was attracted to it myself, so a lot of it appears there. Yes. I'm puzzled by your conclusion that Charlie Russell didn't participate in any of this. That he didn't participate in any of that. Yeah. Uh, well, I think if you look at Charlie Russell's. Uh, body of work, he largely is painting a Montana of his initial appearance in the territory in the 1870s. And I mean, he does the same thing that uh, uh, L.A. Huffman, the photographer, does. L.A. Huffman, for example, arrived in Montana in 1876. He's able to photograph buffalo still on the plains, still wild. 
And yet, starting in 1905, he refused to print any images that he had shot after about 1890 or so. He only would print these images from the 1870s and the 1880s. And Charlie Russell, I think, largely does the same thing, although in some of the illustrations of his letters, he will sort of portray contemporary 20th century life in Montana. But his great, his great works, his great oil paintings, are all about this Dreamtime West that he was so entranced by. Uh, he's pretty, cons pretty significantly regarded by Western art historians as in the nostalgic school, as one who is painting in the 20th century but looking back 50 years and capturing those kinds of images. If that answered your question, I hope it did. Is that what you were... So he participated more than you did. That he participated more? Yeah. Well, I think he did, but, uh, you know, I mean, his famous episode where he supposedly lived with the Indians for a year or so. It's actually about a two-month period uh, where he goes up among the bloods in Canada and it's really because he's he's sparking a young Indian girl that he even stays that long. So I think we've sort of emphasized the notion that he actually experienced a lot more than he really did. He kind of got there right at the tail end of uh, when all the action was happening. But boy, it made an impression on him, for sure. Anyone else? Yeah? Is there anybody? Can I yeah, sure. Another? Yeah. Um, oh, is that uh, Dana? That's Frey Dana, yeah. That's her. It's all about the cuffs on that one. Yeah. And, and you see this very Mary Cassatt like yeah. work on the windowsill. That's her most famous work. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, it's striking to me. Uh, that there could be a conversation um, between Charlie Russell and some of the Native American intellectuals at the turn of the 20th century who often are seen as assimilationists. Yeah. Um, Charles Eastman, Zipla Shah, yeah. Yeah. even Sarah Winnemucca earlier, yeah. where they, and part of what I'm hearing in this conversation about Russell is the acute sense of loss of the, on the part of the people who really saw it happen. Darcy McNichol, you know, born right at the turn of the century, was mourning the fencing of the Flathead Valley, yeah. the Mission Valley. And, and that day and night change of the economy and, and geography uh, hit those people really hard. I think you're right that Russell would have found a lot in common with uh, someone like Darcy McNichol, and I mean Darcy McNichol was younger than Charlie Russell and I don't know that they ever met and had such a conversation, but it would be sort of a wonderful fictional uh, account to see how they would share this sense of loss uh, of a world that I think, I mean it's almost like... Um, you know, they arrive just at the moment that some great sound had ceased and the echoes of it are still palpably in the air. And it, it affects them for their entire lives. I think the next generation of Westerners, you know, are not moved in that way. Uh, people who are born in, into the early 20th century, into, say, 1915, 1920, the time of the Great War, don't look at the West in quite that way, but those who are from that generation of the 1860s through 1920 or so were powerfully affected by, by the change and the transformation, what we call the end of the frontier. Yes? Are they mourning the, the actual life that existed in the frontier, or are they mourning their inability to exploit that kind of a situation? I, that's a great point. I think for some people, uh, what they were mourning was the latter. Uh, you know, the buffalo are gone, and so it's no longer possible to do this. Uh, it's no longer possible to, to hunt buffalo as uh, an economy or a lifestyle. It's no longer possible to trap beaver. I think there's a, it's a complicated question because there, there are people who are mourning the loss of uh, a naturally a natural resource rich West but there are also people I think who are 
um, who are mourning a kind of a loss of freedom. And there is, to be perfectly honest, there is also a sense on the part of a lot of people who are living around the turn of the 20th century that the modern world is becoming feminized. It's one of the reasons that we get uh, the Boy Scouts, for example. It's one of the reasons that the Tarzan novels become so popular in the first decade of the 20th century. There is a sense on the part of particularly men, that what was lost is a very powerful sense of masculine freedom. And so uh, the whole modern world was believed to be a loss of masculine opportunity for a lot of, a lot of men. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt sort of epitomizes that. And he, of course, is a great admirer of all these artists who are portraying uh, this, the world of the strenuous life of the 19th century. Yes? I just wondered if you're thinking, have done thinking about the contemporary visual art scene in this part of the world, and um, is it just too hard to put a handle on it at this point in time? Um, well, I mean, that's a great question. I mentioned by name in the introduction seven or eight or ten of the, the artists who are working in the northern west uh, today, Indian and non-Indian as well, uh, and, and obviously some women too, because there's some very powerful women painters, but I, uh, I sort of made a conscious decision when I was working on the book to really not include uh, a chapter on the the modern tradition. I think a part of this was because it seems to me that the way, because I was comparing the northern Rockies to the southwest, one of the things that happens is that as the literary scene begins to take off in this part of the world, our artistic scene fades away, which is one of the reasons we don't really know much about it. And one of the reasons it fades away is because it had gotten captured by the Charlie Russell sort of cowboy nostalgic imagery that was popular in the 1950s and early 1960s, I mean, along with television uh, shows about the West, Gunsmoke and Wagon Train and all, and all these Western movies from those years. But if you think about the television shows and the Western films, they fade away at about the same time that this regional tradition begins to fade as well. And so we sort of forget about it. Whereas down in the Southwest, under the, the uh, mentorship of people like George O'Keefe, who are embracing modern art traditions, I mean, that art continues to evolve and remain very popular and very energized uh, on, is much appreciated in New York and in San Francisco and in Europe right up until the present day. I mean, Santa Fe today, which is a town the size of Missoula, ranks third only behind New York and Los Angeles in annual art sales. And much of the art that it sells is out of this regional southwestern tradition. So, I mean, I was kind of motivated to let the story fade away by the middle of the 20th century. I think the most recent works that are in the book, Fritz Schilder's painting of Custer uh, was done in about uh, 1971. And I think there's a photo, an Ansel Adams photograph that's a little bit later than that. But nothing else of any later vintage appears in the book. I think it would be difficult for me, at least, to get a handle on what's happening in this part of the world. But I do hope that the painters, the artists who are working here now, maybe find some inspiration from a book like this, that there is a regional tradition they can tap into, that they're not sort of out here on an island, uh, that there is a, a long, I mean, the images in this work go back 8,000 years. Some of that rock art is 8,000 years old. Um, that was Charlie Russell's When the Land Belonged to God, by the way, that just scrolled by. Yeah? Yeah. I would not like to see a wind farm above the, the White Cliffs. 
Uh, no, I would not. And I mean, I don't have to, I, did I feel nostalgia? I think what I felt was sort of what I described. I was stunned by how much my reaction to it had resulted from having sat in my living room or in libraries over the years flipping through art books and sort of recognizing this landscape from that. But the nostalgia question is a little different one. I mean, it's kind of, um, to me, if I embrace nostalgia, I mean, I'm a great advocate of wilderness, but I'm sort of an advocate of wilderness now uh, and not so much an advocate of the wilderness of the historical period. I'm fascinated with it. I like to study it, but I mean, I'm alive in 2010, so I'm interested, yeah, in the Bob Marshall right now. So if you were an artist, would you embrace a wind farm? No. In front of the Rocky Mountain? No. Front, like we're seeing you propose? No, I would not. What, what do we do with that as, as a future? Uh, well, maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe by calling on these iconic images, uh, those can be used to, to resist that kind of thing. But no, I'm not a, I would not be <laughs> pleased with that at all. I think we're probably out of time, so thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>